All right, let's get started. Uh, my name is Jia Liu, and a uh, uh, long history in MSR. Now I'm in um, the visual intelligence team in uh, AI perceptions. So today is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Yi Dan Chen from Duke University. Uh, Yi Dan graduated from Purdue University in 2005, I believe, yes. and um, worked, uh, was an assistant and associate professor at University of Pittsburgh until 2007 before moved to Duke. Now he, um, in addition to the academic duties, he's also the director of the NSF Industrial University Collaborative Research Center for Alternative, Sustainable, and Intelligent Computing. A uh, big effort uh, he's putting together. So uh, without further ado, uh, welcome, Yuan. Yeah, thank you so much, Fajie. OK, um, so it's my great honor to be here to introduce our research work. So um, before I came here, I talked to Jay about what I should give, because um, you know, sometimes we can talk about many, many things. OK, so in my group, we actually my wife is also the faculty member in the same department at Duke. So we actually have a fairly large group, you know, where we have about 30 PhD students at the postdoc. So we're doing from the chip de design until the, some application. But we eventually we decided to give a talk regarding how we're able to obtain some light and efficient you know, deep learning network and how we're able to run those network in some hours. Okay, so that may be something of interest to MSR. So this is the outline. So we'll give a virtual introduction about why, why we want to choose this topic and you know, why this is going to be our major efforts in the research. It'll be very short. Everybody knows this. And then we'll give us three you know, uh, spotlights about you know, how we're able to do the quantization and the pruning and do some compression you know, for different levels of the computing uh, platform, you know, one on the chip. One is actually running in a single machine, and one is on the distributed uh, platforms. Okay, that give you some idea, and then we share our per, uh, you know idea and a perspective about those things. Okay, um, people actually know those things very well. You know, we actually experience you know up and down in the neural network research. You know, we actually everything we're doing here, you know, it, it, it's not that different from what we invented you know thirty years ago when uh, at that time people invented the convolutional neural network, okay? But we, there were three great reasons you know, for us that wasn't able to you know, um, per, you know, apply those in the real scenario. And now we know those reasons include the vanishing uh, gradients because you know, due to this uh, you know, uh, vanishing gradients, we're not be able to you know, uh, efficiently train our neural network. Okay, now we know we need to do the you know, double flowing pole and so on first, so double precision to enable it. Oh, we, 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 at that time, we didn't observe any benefit by adding more layers, but now we know that because we didn't up, uh, add enough layers, so, right? Because at that time, we talked about three or four layers, we will be the deep neural network. Now we're talking about a thousand in the networks. And of course, we don't have very high performance computing devices. And uh, now, you know, it's the uh, computing power of the single chip is actually one million, million or 10 million times higher than the one we used in 20 years ago. So that would be the reason. And of course, you know, after people invented all those uh, technologies which can support you know, the application of the neural network, there's no wonder we now have the renaissance of this neural network, uh, starting from 2006, when you know, Hinden published a paper talking about that they can use the GPU to train all, you know, everything. So, so machine learning is so hard. So if you look at you know, the topic in academia, I'm actually grab some you know, very interesting uh, figures you know, from some news. On this side shows you know, the number of the publications relevant to the deep learning in you know, the academia from different countries. You see you know, the number of those publications increased exponentially in the last couple of years. So that's only about 2015, but actually, I believe there were more and more. And actually China and the US certainly lead this trend. And also, you talk about the restoration of the NIFs, and actually this restoration number you know, increases exponentially too, right? So they used to uh, only register a couple hundred you know, back to only a few years ago, but now you weren't able to find a ticket, right? Because this year, you know, the, the full registration is gone in about 12 minutes, I believe. So a lot of people can't complain about this. But luckily, we have some paper getting in, so I got one, you know, registration because I'm the author. But 
uh, that becomes something crazy. Actually, there was another figure I did not show here. It's uh, like, you know, if you follow the trend, if you don't control the registration number, I think about you know, 20, 2030, 2040, the number of the registration on the NIPs will actually exceed the total population on the Earth. So this is for example about this. Okay, so, um, I, I, you know, I, I was, you know, uh, often asked by many people about, you know, how they'll think about the future of machine learning. Certainly, we are experiencing the peak of the research. So to answer this question, there's another chart to show you know, the prediction um, by uh, basically about the technology adoption by the market and also you know, so on the first. So this is a chart to show the stock price of this uh, new technology industry you know, in the past about 20 years. Um, you will see the PC, the feature phone, the smartphone, AI, so on the first. So you will see the up and down, and they, they usually, you know, slowly uh, grow and then reach the peak, and then quick, quickly drop. Okay, and but the cycle it can be about you know as short as three years or as long as you know the seven or eight years. So if you look at the, the trend in the last uh, a couple of years, you know we actually oh, just uh, took off. Um, now. If you look at the chart, you know, this was about two years ago, you know, we're not at the, at the peak. So there may be one more year we are going to reach the peak, you know, or maybe may, may, maybe two years, so then we're going to see the drop. Okay, so that's uh, the prediction, you know, in terms of the investment, and also the prediction of the market value. Anyway, so my point is, you know, after, the, uh, after that, we will see the maturity of this technology. So we're able to do something before we reach the peak. And after that, you know, we start to extend this technology to different uh, you know, industries. So why is deep learning so hot now? So there's certainly some, you know, driving uh, horses. So we have the big data, we have the algorithm, we have the computational, you know, the power. And I don't need to list down, read all those numbers, you know, or everything about this. And in ideal, you know, we're actually doing uh, some relevant research. For example, in our application side, we work with some com companies you know, on something like a image segmentation, of course, from the computing side, and also some, you know, privacy, you know, the robustness on the first. And on the algorithm side, we are primarily working on the acceleration technology for the neural network. So don't get me wrong, I'm not really die hard, you know, the AI guy. I'm more like, the, you know, doing those research from the computing side, which means I'm trying to improve the computing efficiency for those technology. And also the, on the hardware side, we're doing almost everything we can touch, you know, for the computer pure, pure side, but primarily from the, the computing our platform, so we're designing the chip. Okay, so working on the GPU, CPU optimization, and we're working on the distributed compute building, as we we'll show later on, especially on the heterogeneous, you know, uh, con contest. Okay, so now let's move to the first topic. So uh, I, I was thinking, you know, what could be the good, you know, sequence for me to deliver my talk, either from the top down or from the bottom up. Okay. Then I decide from the bottom up, so then maybe closer and closer to the main uh, focus of the MSR. But I trying to avoid you know the hardware as much as, as I can because I know I'm giving a talk to you know, Microsoft, right? But, <laughs> but then I realized in a way, I still need to give you uh, some background about what is a constraint when we are running those things in the hardware uh, platform. So we, so that's why we decide to start with uh, something we are optimizing on the chip. So give some basic idea about how we're able to do the quantization of the neural network if we have some constraints you know, from the hardware. So the so one example is IBM True Neural Chip. I picked that one because that's a extreme case you know, for the quantization. But we also have a lot of other works regarding the conventional ASIC design or GPU or so on first. But you know, I'm not gonna touch this in today's talk. Okay, so let's talk about the IBM True Neural Chip. So this project uh, was launched uh, in 2008. That's about 10 years ago. Okay, that's actually uh, one of the oldest uh, hardware, you know, DAPA project addressed the mo mo modern, you know, the neural network. I'm not talking about the deep neural network, but neural network, you know, application. So the one chip, you know, of the True North, it includes the 4,000, they call the neural synaptic cores. And the one core is, uh, uh, is composed of you know, the 256 by 256 nodes. Okay, we call that one the neuron, uh, sorry, the synapse. 
So, and uh, we have one core had about 256, you know, the input neuron and the output neuron. So totally, on one single chip, we have about 1 million neurons with 256 million synapses. That's, that's the key. And, the, and the also, you know, every data is represented as a spikes you know, across the whole chip. And the spike will transfer between the, the different cores in that way with a very low frequency. It's about 1K. Um, one, one, you know, 1K hertz. And we have the network to connect all, all, those, all, those, all those cores, and every single neuron is actually have very low resolution or precision, which means they can only represent the three light levels, negative one, zero, and a positive one, no others, okay? So that's, that's why I call the document the extreme case. If you consider it's an INT8, you know, supported by GPU or sonifers. So the whole power of this uh, true neural chip is very low. It's about uh, 65 milliwatts, you know, during the real-time, you know, computation. If you consider GPU can either be 200, TPU 300 watts, it's very low. So how we're we able to use this chip? Okay, so we have some, um, you know, da database, and now that we generate the raw pixels, and then we you know, put into a cafe or any other, you know, uh, uh, a framework to train the neural network. That's like what we are do, doing in the conventional task. And after that, we, are, we will go through something called the CPE, the Collide the Programming Environment, to deploy, you know, the training the neural network down to the true neural chip. And we are doing there, when we are doing this, we basically need to adopt the low precision representation of the synapse, synaptical weights, and also the input will show later on. And we, then we will suffer from so accuracy degradation. And after that, you know, we have a broad pixels, you know, for the, um, you know, the, the task, and we will use the spike encoder to generate the binary spikes at the input of all the tuner chip, and we send it to the chip to do the computation, and we receive the output, which is the accuracy or classification on the first. So now let's also look at the de detail about how we are going to map, you know, our neural network down to this ha hour, okay? So, <coughs> We have the neural network as we, as we show here. So it easily can be represented at the y equals of w, plus, w times x and plus b, b will be the bias, x will be the input, w will be the weights, and the z equals h, you know, the function of, uh, of y. So the h will be the activation function and the z will be the output, okay? And when we are mapping those things to the true neural chip, you know, the input x will be represented as the spikes. And the width, W, will be mapped to the crossbar we show here, and there was always the W prime. Remember, the resolution of the W prime is only three light levels, negative one, zero, and a positive one. And then we generate the output with the Y prime, and then we go through some CMOS circuit to generate the output which is the Z prime. And the Z prime is basically a very simple, you know, uh, uh, color uh, paste neural, neural model. It basically shows zero and one at the output. Okay, so how we're able to map the input, you know, uh, to this, uh, the input can be adopted by the tuner chip. Let's give one example as uh, you know, I'm missed uh, application. We have a 28 by 28 uh, pixel pi uh, pictures, and then we know that the maximum number of the input, you know, will be the 256, which means we have to use a four 16 by 16 uh, block to cover the whole area of one th I missed the picture I'm gonna show here. Okay, there may be some overlap, which is fine. Then the 16 by 16 pixels will be mapped down to this 256 input and sent to one core. That's why we need the four cores to compute the whole things. That is, you know, the um, a framework proposed by IIBM. Okay. Uh, so why we need to tolerate into the degradation in the accuracy? Because in such mapping, we need to map the floating point value down to the integer or even you know the three level representation on the true neural chip. For example, if we have some input which is a 0 0.75, so we need to have a four spikes there within within one frame. And we only inject three of of of, then disable another one, so then we can re to represent 0 0.75. And you can imagine that if we have 0 0.2, we'll be in trouble because we can only represent 0 0.25 or 0, or, uh, or zero. So that is a quantization loss that we will have, right? And uh, also, if we look at, 
the later than well, you know, later doesn't work very well. If you have the the floating point weight, which is 0 0.8, we may have five copies of this crossbar, and then we turn on four of them to be one and one as a zero. So the the so the um, amortized value will be 0 0.8. Okay, yes, please. Uh, when you train the neural network, do you take that constraint into what well, I don't. So this is trained as a floating point normal that's right. network, and you try to convert it. That, and mm -hmm. that's the key, you know, they actually, you know, suffer from the, the, this loss. So this is something we're trying to solve, we show later on. So, you know, so you can ima imagine that if we do such a mapping, we either suffer from the longer competition time because we need to have more uh, spikes to represent the floating point value, or we need to suffer from the larger hardware cost because we need to have a multiple copies and we turn on and turn off, you know, the, the, the weights, okay? And after this, you know, we can prove mathematically if we have enough number of the spikes and also the copies, then the mathematical expectation of the output, you know, which is the y prime, will 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 equal will will be equal to the y. Okay, if we have sufficient number of the copies and the spikes, and in reality, because we cannot really afford inf uh, infinite, you know, the number of spikes and the copies, we suffer from the loss. For example. Originally, if we train the uh, MNIST accuracy to be 95% in the cafe, if we map this thing down to the true north with the one car copy of the crossbar, which is the, you know, the, they call the syn uh, synaptical you know, course, and also one spike per frame, which means you have a binary input, the accuracy will drop down to 90%. If we increase the number of the spikes per frame or increase the number of the hardware copies, you can, you know, you can basically restore, you know, the accuracy up to 92% or 94% by paying the longer competition time or the, the larger hardware cost. And this is something you're going to trade off. Okay. Um, when we received the chip, because, you know, we were the, f the first of several, yes? So is it cheaper to run 16 neural networks or one with floating point? Yes, I'm sorry. Is it cheaper to have 16 neural networks or one with floating point precision? Um, you think the runtime? So if you have multiple copies, you know, then the runtime will be, will be the same because it's running simultaneously like in parallel. But if you have a multiple uh, spikes, they need to input the multiple spikes, which are going to be uh, proportionally increase the computation time. Yeah, yes. 90% uh, accuracy loss, I mean, 5% accuracy loss, yeah. does it require retraining at all, or just purely mapping? Purely mapping, purely mapping. That, that is some, that, that actually is the reason we suffer from this loss. So we better do something in the training process. I know you start to develop, you know, the idea about why, what we're going to do. I'll show you in the next slides, okay. So when we received, the, received this trip in 2014, that's back to, Four years ago, okay. So we were the first several several groups, you know, received the the chip in, in in the world, and they sent me all the, you know, the software, you know, the, the PDK, you know, not PDK, you know, the SDK, you know, so on, so on the first, and uh, which and but the chip is so uh, small because if you want to run something meaningful, you need to have a large number of the copies, so that make us very hard to run anything beyond um, NIST, Okay, so we don't li li like it. But but every board cost me twenty five thousand bucks. It's a big money for university. May not be good for not big money for you guys. So we we're trying to see if we can do some optimization to minimize the hardware cost and also the run run time because we know that is a trade off. So what do we do is we're trying to figure out, you know, the delta y, which is the dif difference between the y prime and the y in this computation. Y prime will be the one we receive on the chip, and the y will be the floating point of value we found the training. And we found out that the expectation of the delta y will be zero. We have already approved, we have already proved this because you know if a number is so big, you know, it'll be the same. 
but the variance of the delta y is not zero. It's basically the sigma of the variance of the wi prime times xi prime. So xi prime will be the quantized input, and wi prime will be the quantized weights. Okay, that be not, will not be a, a zero. However, we cannot really control the input because the input depends on the application and so on first. So now our, our um, goal is trying to minimize the variance of the wi prime. <coughs> that is the idea. Okay. So we do very simple mathematics. So that's the very simple one to show the variance of wi prime equals the expectation of wi prime uh, square minus the square of the expectation of wi prime. So wi prime can be zero, uh, can be zero, one, and a negative one. So this can be normalized between zero and one, basically. Okay. So we have the probability to turn on and turn off the zero and one weights at the pi. And then the value of this will become pi times one minus, minus pi. So pi will be the probability we turn off the, 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 the one bit, you know. The, the. If you look at this, so what will be the condition to achieve, you know, the minimal product between pi and one minus pi? When pi equals a zero, a zero right? And what's the ma maximal you know, value of this product when pi is 0 0.5? So the value will be 0 0.25. It's actually, we learned this from the elementary school. We don't need to have no, any mathematics on this. So what does that mean? That means that if you look at the variance we generate you know, on the my <coughs> mapping scheme, then if the normalized uh, training the width is between 0 and 1, Okay, and it's around 0 0.5, then the my, my pin variance will be the largest one, which is 0 0.25. If the training of value is actually, norm, normalized training value is actually 0 and 1, then the variance will be a 0. It's very simple, right? Because if we, if, we, if we normalize the width, if the width, we know we can only represent 0 and 1 in our hardware. So if the training the width will be 0 and 1, we will perfectly map this width to 0 and 1. But if we train something which is 0 0.20, 0 0.5, which one we shall we choose? 0, 0.0 or 1? Which, either one will give us the largest variance. A very simple idea. Okay, now the question becomes how we're able to train our neural network you know, to make sure you know, the width or majority of the width will be 0 and 1 in our neural network. Well, in other words, you know, close to the binary neural network. Okay. So if you still remember how we created the loss function, we basically trying to reduce the um, difference between the, the target output and also you know, the, the, the one we receive. So, and if we don't do anything, then the training the width distribution will, will become like this. We still see the big you know, pig and the zero and the one, but anything else will be evenly distributed across the normalized range, which is zero and one. So if we map this uh, distribution of the width down to the true north, it will be like this. So the brighter color means you know, the large variance. You will see, you know, actually we see the large variance you know, when we are mapping this things to the true north chip. But if we add a penalty, so basically we generate the penalty function, we give the largest penalty when we train the neural network, you know, whose width is about 0 0.5, then the largest penalty will be 0 0.5, the lowest one be zero. We're basically trying to push the training the width you know, to zero and one. Okay, so try to avoid zero to 0 0.5. It's a very simple penalty we add on the, uh, the loss function. And the result will be like this. So the distribution of the training the width will be closer to zero and one. A very minimal number of the weights are still around 0 0.5. Okay, so the, what you train it will be what you will get on the training chip, like this one, the totally black, which means it's very close to the one original training value. It's actually we only change one line of the code the IBM sent to us. So just one line. Let's look at the result. So the the right one is the result you know we directly derive from the IBM SDETK, and the yellow one is our method. Okay. So in any cases. The number of the spikes per frame, the number of copies, we outperform, you know, the baseline of the IBM, you know, a product, you know, like we show here. Well, remember, we only show one line. And if you look at the speed up, if we achieve the same accuracy, we can achieve the 6.5 times the speed up because we have to dramatically reduce the number of the spikes, you know, per frame. Or we can reduce the, the core occupation, which is the hardware cost, by two thirds. We only need one third of this uh, hardware. 
and uh, we see the very consistent, you know, the, the relation between the spec per frame on the, the core reduction, so on, so on, so on the first. Okay. Um, due to the contract, we will not be able to publish these things until the 2016 or, or, or 15 because they hold our publication for more than one year. They can file, you know, all the things there. They actually include these things in our latest SDKs, you know, give to not only the academia, but also to their government, you know, uh, customers. But the downside of this, they think then they don't allow us to touch their code anymore. They just give us binary code. It's a done deal. Okay, the UN don't touch our code so anymore. So that's the first thing I want to talk. So the second one I'm going to give is, well, let's move our uh, focus down from the chip level to the single machine li level. Let's say, you know, how we're able to simplify the neural network and then promote, you know, the computational efficiency for the neural network. We call the structural sparsity of the deep neural network. So if you look at, you know, the trend of the neural network, we have more and more, you know, parameters, you know, running, and the, every parameter is we need to count compute, which means, you know, the competition cost is almost proportional to the number of the parameters that we have in the neural network, right? So, and so how to reduce the number of the parameters in deep neural network, you know, is uh, uh, becoming the full focus in the acceleration of the neural network and uh, people trying many, many different methodologies to reduce those things with, without, you know, sacrificing the qualification accuracy. So let's put it in the uh, way. So, in 2015, you know, the, the, some people proposed, you know, some methodology trying to do weight regularization with L1 NOR. The basic idea is very similar as we use in the, in the true north, you know, the chip. They basically gave the penalty, you know, to the width, which is very large, okay? And they try to push the distribution of the width, you know, close to the uh, a zero and because they can safely remove those widths by assuming the small width won't generate a huge impact on the output. That's a really going to be a reasonable assumption if we consider the input is going to be very random. So they show the results saying, okay, so they can achieve very high sparsity by removing more than 90 percent width, but still, you know, um, achieving good accuracy. And the theoretical speed up will be very large, you know, more than 10 times. Remember, I'm talking about theoretical speed up, okay. And, and also the Songhan, they actually, they proposed, you know, the NIPS 2 and 5 doing similar things, but they extend from the convolutional layer to the fully connected layer, especially in the all the way, and they achieved a very similar result I will show here. But if you look at this, you know, there is a issue here. The issue is, if you really take their code uh, running on the GPU, you will not get the practical speed up for many layers. So this is the result we show when we were running their codes, okay? We're running on the GPU, so on the different GPUs. You will find out that when the speed, when the speed up is larger than one, that basically shows the positive, you know, the, uh, acceleration. If the speed up is slow, is smaller than one, that will be the negative, which means they slow down the computation. So if you look at the different convolutional layer, you'll find out not every <coughs> layers will give us a positive uh, speed up, and many of them will be the negative, which means that you even slow down the computation, you know, in, in the different uh, GPU uh, platform. Why? It's a very simple, because um, we, the yearly, you know, the appearance of those, uh, you know, the widths so smaller than the threshold show up in the random positions of the neural network. If we pick up those uh, run, uh, randomness and remove those uh, words, then we'll gener generate random sparsity. We will we'll create a lot of a hole when we are storing those words in the memory. That will generate irregular memory access. We read one width, we are expecting the next nice data will be the one we want. We prefetch those stuff, we we'll load this one in, but we got cache miss. Then we need to have a very poor very poor cache locality, we need to go through the mean memory, go to the disk, or get another one, and then we keep doing this stuff. Yes? Does this also apply, two questions, does this also apply in fully connected layers or only the convolutional layers? Uh, both, both. Yeah. both. Both. And the second one, what if I don't just remove individual parameters from the filters, but I remove filters as a whole? You're talking about the one we, we proposed. Saying, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
You are talking about the one we proposed. Oh, okay, that's good. That's, what, that's called the structural one. Yes, okay. yes, very good. No, I, okay, you know, I, I'm, I'm joking, but I don't like to give a talk in MSR. But you guys, when I, when I started, you know the answer. So what, 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 you know, what's the point for me to, to talk? No kidding. So very good. So people actually trying to hard code this non-zero width in the source code. Okay, that's a very, you know, inefficient idea. Or they can customize their hardware. They do, you know, some, you know, lowering stuff, you know, to do the work. And that's be, you know, very for, for me a very dumb idea. Okay, but you know, you know, Adim uh, just Adim just mentioned it. There is the art, there is a, a simpler way to solve the problem, which is. We don't have to re we don't have to remove those words in the random way. We should remove those things in the structural way. We can remove the whole line, the whole column, the whole block, and we we'll still maintain the locality of the cache, you know, access to on the first, right? And then we will we see the good speed up. So then to convert the theoretical speed up to the practical speed up, that's the key. Now the question becomes how we are able to do it. And, and uh, we, or in other words, in which levels of granularity we can we, we can do this. So, so we propose something we call the group la so it's not new. Let me put it this way: group la so is not new. We didn't we, we didn't in, in, in invent. But the basic idea is, besides you know the difference between the target output, we also generate so another term we call the group la so, and we show here that's a lambda g times r g is so on the first. This will this. You know, item will partition the width into different groups, and within the group, they still maintain the spatial correlation or locality. Okay, so we can safely remove the whole block, by you know, but you know, I still maintain the, the locality of, of the cache. One example like this. Let's say we have three words. Okay, so we have W0, W1, W2, and we know W0 and W1 it actually stay you know in the same uh, block. So we basically partition the three ways into two groups, and then we can either minimize this group or minimize that group. We can safely remove one of them or both of them. Okay, so that's the case. But we don't individually remove one out of W0 and W1. Mathematically, you can prove that. It basically means we are imposing the constraints like this blue you know, the space show here, and this will be the optimization surface. We're trying to move those two, eventually find out the cross. That would be the optimization point. Okay, so move down to the visualization of the neural network. So we basically can you know, penalize the unimportant filters and channels. We can remove all of them. We can do, we can learn actually the corresponding position on each filter. So we can actually re, you know remove those positions because they also you know store in the whole column and not whole row in the in the memory. We can even actually remove the whole la layers, but we need to bypass the 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 the, 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 the input to the output and show here. So we call that one the filter wise, the channel wise, the shape wise, or the depth wise. So there are many many you know the correlation between different structure which we can we can play okay so and we need to group we need to group uh, group them res respectively so let's look at the result okay let's say give one example like learn and uh, amnest okay so the, our baseline will have the 0 0.9 percent arrow so we have the number of the filter you know, for, for, for the different layer will be the 20 to 50 the kernel number of 1 to 20 this will be the original baseline if we want to maintain the similar error rate that'll be the 0 0.8 you know, the number of the filters will reduce down to a 5 to 9, 9, 19, and the channel number will down to the 1 to 4, and then we, on, we reduce the number of flops and down to 25 to 7.6 person. That is one. And the speed up is now like a 4 to 10 times. That would be, if you're running on the GPU, that would be the, you know, 1.6 to 5, 5 times. Okay, that's a real, you know, uh, speed up. And if we, uh, if we can tolerate, you know, relaxing 0.1 percent of accuracy, we will have number of the filter will be down to the 3 to 12. You know, the channel number 1 to 3, and we'll even, you know, re re you know, generate a smaller number of the flops. You know, so the larger uh, speed up. If you look at, you know, how we visualize the fuel filters, yeah, we have so many different things. But actually, if we really extract the major features, not that. Uh, many. We still maintain the majority of the important fe features here, so that's uh, that, that's the key. So we have a lot of redundancy which we can re re safely remove. 
And regarding the learning filtership, you know, we have to kind of remove the original five to five, you know, to down to the 21, or even to seven, you know, by maintaining the similar accuracy, 0.5% or one per percent, and that'll be, you know, very similar rate right now. And if we combine them together, we better kind of remove the whole row and the whole column. So we're still going to see the good, you know, the, the retaining of those features. And the error rate is you know, about 1% for much larger, you know, the neural network. And uh, you can, the row sparsity and the column sparsity we put here. So, and you can receive the speed, the speed up. Okay, so that is uh, the combination of those technologies. So it's, um, it's more like this, okay. That's basically we remove the whole column and the whole, and the whole, whole row. Um, we run on the GPU and the CPU, I'll basically show here, okay. So um, this um, is the original, um, uh, let, let me see what, how I'm gonna present this one, okay. So this is uh, you know, it's a, it's a higher requirement on the high accuracy or the error rate. So you will see that, you know, um, you will see that you know, for the L1 nor that's usually the people use for random you know, subordinate. A lot of layers, you actually got a negative speed up, as we just showed. Okay? But for us, we always got a positive one, so that's the key. And if you if a loss to, to tolerate about 2% accuracy loss, because some people like to trial you know, the trainings on the first, we can even push the speed up you know, four, four uh, or farther. And uh, the L1, which is the original design, still gave us a negative, you know, the speed up in some cases. Actually, if you compare with the GPU and the CPU result, you will find out, you know, the GPU is more sensitive to the structural, you know, uh, data uh, storage. So which means the random, you know, sparsity, you know, is actually uh, not favored by the G G GPU. Uh, our platform because the CPU route combination is more sensitive to so sort of stuff. And we can achieve higher um, improvement compared with our baseline. For the CPU, because anyway, they'll be bad you know, on the baseline, so it won't, won't be that sensitive. That's the second one way we learn. As, you know, this technology has been adopted by many uh, companies, we'll show later on. And, and, the, and the very interesting part is if how we are able to re, re, remove the layers, okay? People actually, it's not new. People have been doing this for, for, uh, for, for quite a while. So original one, the Rust 9 with 20 or 32, we can safely reduce the num number of layers down to 14 and 18 um, without sacrificing the error. And, and if you look at you know, the trend of removing those layers, they actually not a mon you know, monolithically, uh, you know, reduce the error rate. So they basically see, you know, actually the 18 will be the op op optimal um, number, and after that, if you keep reducing the number of layers, you know, the error rate will increase. But before that, you are not going to see, you know, the monolithic uh, monolithical trend because there's going to be up and down there. The detail analysis will find out, you know, which layer we are removing. It's actually the intermediate layers, okay? Because in the beginning, you are you you basically process the data, and after that, you extract the fee features, you know, some first. And the one in the middle doesn't really give you you know much help compared with adding other layers. Yes. Yes. <coughs> Sorry. Has this uh, sort of observation or insights changed across the you know, different data sets or different tasks? Uh, Mm -hmm. For instance, I see this is Resnet for Cyber 10, right? What if, uh, what if this is for Image Net right now? We see the similar trend, but there are some variations across the DAV from your network. Yeah. Here's my question, I guess. Yeah. Um, um, so for this pre-trained network, let's say for Image Net versus uh, Cyber 10, right? right. The, the amount of uh, tasks that you are doing is it's very different. One is a smaller classes, the other is much larger classes. So right. just wondering for the same network structure, right? Uh, how generic that needs to be, and how much room you have for pruning? Uh, does it depending on the, the actual task that you are targeting, or this is? I I, I understand. Um, unfortunately, there is an theoretical concurrent about. If you have a different neural network with a different structure, you know how well the pruning will be able to apply. People just just try. Okay, uh, we are doing some research now, trying to understand 
how the different layer process the features and how this information will be transferred to the different task and the different output like this. So it's more like, so it's relevant to the interpretable you know, neural network, right? So our, we, we thought some result about this because if you look at the trend, um, we see some, we see the impact of uh, the neural network uh, on the output like the, basically the curve like, like this. We start from beginning then when there is some peak and after this is the drifting down. We show some data maybe, uh, maybe offline, but we, st well, we still don't have a mathematical proof why that is the case. But, um, but our, um, but, you know, um, but our, our observation is there are some layers which are actually in the middle of this layer, <coughs> even they don't really, for one neural network, if, even they don't really impact the output that much in this uh, pruning. But this layer become very critical if we design the transfer lower learning neural network. This is actually very interesting. We don't understand why, because the pruning shows us this, okay, but the transfer learning shows us something else. We can talk, I can show you the result later. Yeah, you want to have me? I'm Dr. Chen's student. So yeah. uh, you work, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> our, our work is more addressing interpretability and chrome. I just published it. Uh, yeah, so we'll okay. Yeah. Okay. So, but that's a very good, that's a very good you know, question. Um, we, but we, we don't have a mathematical proof. We only have some of our observation there, yeah. So last one I'm talking about, I have about 10 minutes. The last one about the 10 grand. So this is actually the one uh, talk we're given, uh, we, 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 uh, we, we have given in you know, last year NIPS. Uh, luckily, this, this work was selected as one, one of the oral talk in the last year NIPS. This was a picture uh, from the last year NIPS. I'm not sure you can see this. There were about 5,000 5, people there. So my student gave a talk <laughs> about this. Um, you better see this. Basically, you need to look at the uh, uh, screen. Okay, so it's actually about the distributed deep learning because now move move our levels up. So we, well, I'm I'm sure you are very familiar with the parameter server so on first, right? So you better partition the neural network and then you, for, you partition the da data. You, you, for each node, you copy. You know, basically, keep the one replicate of the of the model, and then after some 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 training, you basically send this uh, information to the parameter server, do a synchronization, and send them back, you know, so on first. So if you look at those things, you will you will find out the bottleneck will be the communication between between the parameter server and the, you know the, the nodes. So and the larger you know the the the, uh, the larger the system is, you know, this scenario will become more c c severe. Um, so <clears throat> when we look at this, we are very familiar with c compression, quantization, acceleration, right? We try to see if we can do something to minimize the communication between the nodes and also the parameter server. And we found out, of course, you know, the extreme case will be you don't really send the data. You just send the three levels, negative one, positive one, and uh, zero. You can send two, negative one, positive one, but that won't convert, so it's really later on why. But it's just three. So we call the, ten, you know, you'll need to tenorize you know, the uh, gradients, you know, so you can send these three values to tell people you can either increase the value or reduce the value or keep the same, right? So those are the things. And then by doing so, you can dramatically reduce the communication because you don't have to send the floating point value, you know, so on the first. Now the question becomes how you can represent, you know, the, um, you know, gradients basically between those uh, nodes and those parameters server without sacrificing the accuracy that, that much, right? Um, so <clears throat> before we do this, we actually do, we have to do some math, but I'm not going through all the details, don't worry, I'm not going through this. But the basic idea is we found out, you know, many years ago, actually 20 years ago, some of, uh, some, someone, you know, uh, proved that if we can constrain, you know, this, uh, this value to within some range, and then we can guarantee the convergence of such a training process. Um, even we send out, you know, such a comprised, uh, you know, information. But there's no guarantee about the accuracy, it's just about convergence. But would that be enough, okay? Then we talk about how we're able to, you know, find out a good representation of this gradients, you know, in this one. Okay. So let's look at you know what we have done. 
we start with original, you know, the uh, gradients, you know, distribution. And the, if you think about the communication theory, we don't. If the the best way to, to transfer the, the sampling of the signal is not to transfer the, the sampling. It's going to transfer the parameters describing the distribution of this C signal. And the, and this the distribution of this uh, gradients follow some types of the distribution. Okay. So, and based on this, we just give some parameters to describe this distribution from one to another end. It can restore, you know, this values of another, from another end. You just need to send them like a, like a mean or sigma or something first, and also the one, negative one, zero to adjust all those, all those stuff. But before you do this, you have to do the clipping to constrain the value to some range to guarantee the convergence. That's something we learn from the, from, from, from the math. Okay, so we do we have original one. We do the, do the clipping. We do the tenorant. Uh, we do, the, we, do we, we, we tenorize the values. You know, by assuming they're they are following some distribution, we send to another end and we restore I, I, everything. And let's see the re results. It's a very common trick we use in the communication research. Yeah, pretty good. Turn, 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 uh, so on. For top one accuracy and iteration, you know, following the increase of the iteration, you see the baseline and the ten grand one. Natural accuracy, you know, very close to the, the our base one. And if you look at the, the training loss versus you know the iteration, it's also very good. So even actually faster than the, than the base one. For Alex Knight, you know, if we have a number of workers from two, four, and eight. So we basically, you know, increase the BME batch size, and we reduce the number of the iterations. And if we look at all the results, you know, for the floating point, that's the original baseline for the 10 grand. The accuracy is very similar. Okay, just a very minor degradation. If we don't do the leaping, there, there is a two per person accuracy, which means that the convergence is sort of, sort of becomes, a, you know, becomes a problem. So that's why you know we need to do the clipping here. Okay, so just uh, as you know, and for the la larger neural network, you know we have the similar things, but you know of course the accuracy loss will be larger. You know that's the that's the uh, yeah, that's the expected, but still in the good you know the in the in the in the good range. So we even created a performance model. You know that model has been used by many following pay papers. And uh, to simulate, you know, if we have a different bandwidth between the primary server and the nodes, for example, you know, the Ethernet and PC, uh, PCI switch, or infinite band and the link, how our, our methodology will affect the performance. And you will find out the larger bandwidth will make our methodology less effective. You understand this because you know you don't really need it because your bandwidth is so large. But still, we can achieve about you know the uh, you know two to three times performance improvement. We are actually running those things with HP Lab, and we, we will collaborate with them. When we run, we actually verify these things in you know in their uh, in environment. Okay. It's not the end. Okay, we talk about the papers. You know, the best paper. Yeah, it's good. You know, the NIPS, which is good. But I'm more care about you know the impact in the real industry. So here's a, here is a, here are the results. Our one level quantization my my method, which we just talked about, is including the latest uh, not PDK I, I, SDK of I, IBM True, True North Chip. Okay. Our structural pruning technology is supported by the library of the Intel Nirvana, you know, the neural network processor. You can actually up download this one, you know, in their in their library on, on Zoom. And it's also adopted by Intel new with the NLP because we extend this technology to not only CN, basically convolutional and fully connected layer, and all the RN and RSTM. So they will support this in their coming microprocessor. And it's adopted by the other technology, ISF technology in China, called Shunfeng, actually the logistic one, uh, to two times performance improvement without changing their hardware infrastructure in the data center. They're, we're doing nothing, we just you know, rewrite their uh, framework for tra training. So the, the, our 10 grand technology is supported by the Facebook Cafe too. Now you can download that one in the PyTorch. And the HP parameter server product has already 
you know, in, in encoded in their products. So it's a real product, you're going to buy it, and they're going to sell, 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 sell it. Okay, to share our perspective, as I'm close to the end, so AI is going to be the mainstream. There's no wonder that more than people jump into it, you know, show the great potential in the belt cloud and the edge, but the limitation on the infrastructure is always be the issue because we are always graded on all the computing power so on the first, okay? So no matter how much you have, we're going to yaw, yaw, yaw them up. And the future AI will be more user-friendly, more automatic, more cost-efficient. That's something we're trying to, trying to do. And accuracy isn't always the primary goal. And there exist many trade-offs among all the metrics of an AI system. Not only about the efficiency, computation efficiency, you know, accuracy, but also the privacy, accuracy, the all, you know, those private, sorry, privacy, safe, safety, and all the kind of, kind of things. Okay, so I think I'm, uh, oh, by the way, that's the, that, that, that's the page of our center across the three universities. I'm the director, and I'm open for any questions, you know, you, you may have. Yeah, thank you. Yes. So in your uh, group sparsity uh, optimization, uh, I wonder if you need to write any uh, special optimization code in the, for CPU or for GPU, and uh, uh, if you just uh, uh, use the default implementation, will, will you be still able to uh, achieve the same uh, speed up? You are, yeah, that's a very good question. Question. Um, simply change one line will give you some speed up, but not enough. Okay, so um, you the better way is if you really can control the lowering uh, uh, our process. Basically, means you can, you know, manipulate you know the data the, the data mapping procedure you know down to the you know the, 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 the computing infrastructure. You can get a better result. Um, we have another paper actually published in iClear, I think 2017 or 16, I forgot. You know, talk about this. We basically, we, 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 we rewrite the, the library of Intel C, C, CPU lowering process to achieve additional sp speed up on top of the group. Uh, so, yes, if you can do that, yes, you will. And if you know more information about how the data is a uh, store in the memory, how data is loaded, then you will achieve more uh, improvement. Yeah. Okay, because people are more interested in uh, mobile platform, like, uh, yes. yeah, especially for uh, high efficiency uh, inputs. Right? So uh, I wonder, uh, for example, like uh, the model optimization work, which one can give better performance uh, improvement on, on mobile platform? For example, like a group, mm -hmm. uh, group uh, or the uh, other coach? People try all, all the things. Actually, Jim may know, you know, actually, um, we, you know, I'm organizing the IEEE Low Power Pattern Recognition Challenge. Okay, so we run our computation every year, and we have workshops in the PR every year. So we thought our, basically, our um, participant, participants, they optimize everything. That's even quantization of adding every single layer, optimize the library, you know, or even the protocol to fetch the data from the server, so on the first, you know, to speed up this. On the same platform, like TS2, in the last three years, the peak performance in our computation improved by 12 times for only for the, on the same, on the same hardware, uh, Apply for. There is a dramatic wrong you can import it, but you need to very carefully customize every single piece of you, yeah, of your design. Yeah. Yes. So I also have a question about like your structural sparsity. Mm -hmm. uh, and so like from the theoretical, maybe we could go back to one of the slides if that would be oh, possible. Sure. Yeah. I did see some like speed up numbers like on the right hand column. Sure. Um, uh, yeah, so right here, oh, keep going to back right. Yeah, on the speed up right here, hmm? were these like theoretical numbers or observed numbers? <coughs> no, it's a real number. Real, real numbers? Yeah, but, but it's, a little, it's a little bit tricky about this because we don't really consider the data preparation lowering. It's basically the only the computation part. Okay. Yeah, so it's, so it's a little bit tri tricky to see this number. If we really consider all the, the the head and tail of the computation that will be now that significant. Now, now that significant. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. 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 Ye
That yeah. Makes sense. yeah, I guess I was kind of going to answer my question because like the difference between like 2x and Oh, no. Is That's why you'll see if I report like 10 times, if I really work with uh, like ISF technology, two times is the best one we can get. Theoretically, you can get like eight or 16 times, but that's, you know, it's very hard. And when like SF technology kind of like implemented this method, were there like any lessons that we kind of learned from bringing that in? Uh, there there are many lessons. I think I should write a, an article about, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there are, I have one student, you know, actually went there, worked with them for three months to optimize their whole infrastructure. There are many things. Or re regional goal, that'd be eight times to speed up. After three months, we can we can only achieve two two times. But because there are many constraints in the real you know scenario, yeah. Are there like any examples that like stuck out to you that you'd like feel comfortable sharing or? Mm. I I I think I will write a, a paper about this. So yeah, but too 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 busy on so many things. But I I, I think I will I will I will write some 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 something about this. Thanks, Yuan, again. Thank you.